Okay, welcome everybody. Um, we're excited to tell you about developments in modern GNSS and its impact on autonomous vehicle architectures. This is a paper by myself, I'm Nils, and my co-author Tyler, who's co-presenting with me, uh, and our third author, uh, Fergus Noble. Uh, let's get right into it. Uh, we, and I think everybody here agrees that perception is a key to autonomy. And it's advances in perception sensors, such as LIDAR, cameras, and radar, coupled with machine learning algorithms that is fundamental to building autonomous vehicles. Uh, but unaided, these perception sensors are struggling to solve the autonomy problem safely and reliably. And this is perhaps not surprising if you think about the fact that perception sensors such as cameras or LIDAR, they have to contend with uh, huge ambiguities in the world. They have to deal with outages from environmental effects such as weather, there's faults from sensor glitches, and it's, it's generally a challenging problem. Now, the, the industry has observed that precision localization and precision localization coupled with high accuracy maps can overcome some of these challenges. And in this talk, we specifically want to look at how GNSS and GNSS-based localization over the last decade, decade and a half, has uh, gotten to a point where we think that they're ready to help the autonomy problem directly. Now, GPS and autonomy have a, have a long history, and in fact, in the late 2000s at the DARPA, great, at the DARPA Grand Challenges, um, these competitors all used GPS, but they did not rely on standard GPS as a core part of autonomy. They only used GPS for route planning. And the reason for this is that although GPS does provide global localization, it suffers from limited precision, and it also suffers from errors and faults. And so I just listed a few of the error sources here. Things like the atmosphere introduces multiple uh, meters of error on any measurement of range to a satellite. Um, the orbital data is not always entirely correct. Your clocks drift and all the like. So in, in the last 13 years, since the first DARPA Grand Challenge, uh, we've identified seven major developments that come together to create a new modern GPS architecture that creates a step change in performance, which I'd like to talk to you now. Uh, the first of these is that we now have multiple independent GNSS constellations. So the graph on the left shows you just the number of GPS satellites or GNSS satellites in orbit. Uh, this is from the United States, Russia, the European Union, and China. And as an example, uh, on the right, this is over San Francisco over the course of 24 hours and you'll see the kind of minimum and maximum satellites that you have in view at any point in time, you're now at a, at a minimum of 25 satellites and maximum of over 35. And this means that you've got approximately seven times more satellites in view than you need to just provide basic positioning service. And this gives you the ability to do redundancy. And since these are independent constellations, you can start cross-checking not just between satellites, but also between constellations. And all this helps you uh, with resiliency. The modern satellites are also transmitting modern signals and then transmitting this across multiple frequencies. So modern satellites are transmitting on three frequencies, these, uh, these signals. Um, the modern digital codes that they use can be acquired in milliseconds rather than seconds. The noise on them is much lower. And all of this means that the uh, quality of your positioning is improving significantly. Thirdly, there's been uh, great advances in new algorithms that specifically target correcting errors and faults. All of these work on the same fundamental principle, which is that rather than just taking a GPS measurement, you combine that with corrections from a monitoring infrastructure. I'll just highlight one of these algorithms, which is called PPPAR. This algorithm gives you decimeter level performance and it'll converge in under a minute. Uh, and this allows you to start correcting for the noise, errors, and faults that were so problematic previously. And we refer you to the paper for much more detail. Fourthly, you need ground-based monitoring networks to feed these algorithms. And this has massively been rolled out. Here's just a, an image of one distribution of, monitoring, uh, of a monitoring network that's available. And these monitoring networks estimates the errors and faults, and they enable both high precision through powering these algorithms. And they also provide fault monitoring. So you can start making guarantees and alert and provide alerts when you cannot guarantee performance within a certain set of bounds. 
these corrections need to be delivered to the end user. And fortunately, uh, standardization of these corrections formats are happening, and it's happening in the 5G rollout that's currently occurring uh, around the globe. And what this means is this corrections data and corrections algorithms are becoming a utility. Uh, and so the idea of having a GPS that has a high precision and also integrity outputs to provide alerts when there's faults is becoming commercially available and it's becoming commercially available uh, continent-wide. Once you have this accuracy, you run into an interesting problem. Uh, the earth moves. And in fact, in some parts of the California coastline, the earth will move as much as 10 centimeters per year laterally. Fortunately, the GNSS community and the, and the broader geodetic community is, has designed new models such as ITRF 2014 and NOAA's HTTP, which all provides you the ability to correct and track drift in the crust. And so this allows you to now do very, very high accuracy localization on high precision maps and understand how they move due to earth deformation. And then lastly, unlike uh, a decade ago, we now have mass market automotive chips. They're on the order of $10 and these chipsets can be integrated into vehicles and can provide the receiving all these modern signals. But when you put this all together, we see what a modern GNSS system looks like. A set of constellations such as GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and Baidu transmitting multiple frequencies that's received on a vehicle with modern GPS chipsets, receiving corrections networks, corrections data over the cell phone network from cloud computing where these algorithms are running that is powered from a set of GPS base stations. Um, this is the state of state of the art in modern GNSS. And I'll hand it over to my co-author Tyler to tell you through what the results of these systems look like. Niels, thank you. I think to really highlight how far we've come in the last 20 years, it's really a great exercise to show all the different automotive studies uh, in one place. And the first thing that stands out is, you know, 20 years ago when GNSS first became available widely for, for civil use, you could expect, you know, 10 or more meters of accuracy. So not, not fantastic performance. Whereas if you were to fast forward to today with all the amenities that, that Neil describes, you know, multi-frequency, multi-constellation, um, all these correction services and other standards, lane level localization is possible. And in fact, in our paper, we highlight the last study uh, on this particular list here, which showcases a trip from San Francisco to Seattle. Uh, where you can achieve that, you know, 35 centimeters two sigma positioning uh, with 95% availability, availability. So it really shows how far we've come, especially in the last few years. Uh, Niels, if you could go to the next slide, please. And it's not just accuracy where we've seen improvements. You know, there's also seen uh, huge strides in integrity. And what we mean by integrity is that modern GNSS receivers, you know, in part of what, in part of what their function and what they provide is, is an alert. And when GNSS cannot guarantee its position bounced within a few meters, uh, modern receivers will, will let you know. And what this particular uh, you know, plot shows is an example of the kinds of protection levels that now could be guaranteed to very, very high levels of, of reliability. And these alerts are enabled by, by a few things. One is by the multi-signal redundancy that we now have available to us, as well as from these central monitoring stations to, to find these faults in real time and, and give us a, a sense of these uh, errors that are, that are out there lurking. But the other one is, um, but the, the real advantage that by putting all these things together is that now you no longer have a very highly accurate position. You also have one with guarantees on it, where in this example, um, the kind of guarantees that you can expect are at a rate of 10 to the minus seven failure per hour on a false negative. So in other words, that the, uh, the GNSS, the error in the GNSS position that you, that you experience uh, will only exceed a few meters uh, without alarm for once every thousand years of operation. So it's pretty incredible when you're trying to make the case for safety. Uh, next slide, please. So next, I would like to discuss the predominant architectures that are emerging for autonomous vehicles. We're, you know, largely speaking, we're seeing two you know, categories emerging, one in this level two category for you know, driver assistance technologies and the other in you know, these fully autonomous category for level four. And I'd like to address the, the, the benefits that precision GNSS can bring to these architectures going forward. Uh, next slide, please. When we look at a level two system, you know, predominantly these are a vision approach system. So that's you know, the first and foremost sensor in these uh, where you know, perception system is responsible for you know, lane, in lane positioning and also planning around you know, other perceived actors in the field. And what, what precision GNSS brings to the table 
is an independent lane determination with maps. And really that's foundational for, for safety. And this dramatically expands the situational awareness. It also protects against several faults, including you know, the mis potentially the misdetection of lane lines uh, push and putting the vehicle in dangerous situations. Uh, and so it really adds the context to drive with confidence in these, in these, um, in these ADAS systems. Uh, next slide, please. When we look at level four systems, predominantly, you know, often we see these are equipped with LIDAR as, as our primary perception sensor, as well as being used for localization. Uh, but LIDAR is not immune to uh, errors or faults, and often uh, it can fail in environments that are very sparse, uh, you know, environments where there are not many features that are unique to, the to that situation to lock onto. And in fact, this is very complementary to GNSS because this is in areas where GNSS works very, very, very well. And so with GNSS being complementary and having those uh, you know, independent failure modes, it really helps build the, the safety case in, in building these systems and having that truly redundant sensor for localization uh, in building those systems uh, in the future. Uh, next slide, please. And, and closing here, uh, you know, looking forward, what GNSS really brings to the table is building an ecosystem of information sharing. You have all of these different vehicles communicating with each other and with infrastructure, you know, using a consistent reference frame. And really what this enables is collaboration to overcome occlusions, you know, where you can truly see around corners from the sensor data from you know, other vehicles in the area sharing that with you. Um, it also just allows you to share per perception and, and operate collectively and, and really to just collaborate uh, as, as, a, as one big system. Uh, next slide, please. And so th this concludes our talk. Thank you very much for your inter for your for your attention. Uh, the link to our paper is, is can be found there. And we also welcome any questions by email if you have any. And uh, yeah, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.